Good morning. If you're here for the first time this morning, I'm Jim, and I'm your pastor. Uh, Happy Independence Day weekend. Uh, Thanks to all of you who came to our big uh, Independence Day celebration, which was a luau this year. Uh, That was a fun a party that I looked forward to, and I'm glad uh, you uh, took part in as well. Thanks to all of you who volunteered. It takes a lot of hands to make that thing happen, and so I appreciate you being a, a part of that too. Um, thanks to all of, you, of those, all of you who uh, attended the uh, Kostrelisky Memorial Service yesterday. Uh, it was a beautiful time to be family together, uh, and uh, you know I, I'm at a place now where I ap- appreciate a family, especially on weekends like this one, where we celebrate our. The freedom we have to, to be a, a family of faith together, the freedom that we have to worship together, because uh, it's easy to, to follow the news and, and this world and, and realize that the, the world is in a challenging place, to look around and, and see that, you know, the, the church is declining in our day, and Islam is rising, and, uh, you know, gay marriage is now the, the law of the land in our country, and uh, there's, there's a rattling of sabers about taking away all the religious tax exemptions and, you know, just making life a little bit harder on religious organizations out there. And, you know, in all that, I still look around our world and I think, we're still more free here to worship than most places in the world. And we still, and in a society, if it were a completely level playing field where all voices got exactly the same amount of attention, the gospel of Jesus Christ is still the best story there is to tell. Amen? Amen. So I'm, I'm thankful. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah, you said amen and clap. That was both Presbyterian and Pentecostal at the same time. That was incredible. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> uh, but I am, I am thankful that we can still gather together and worship and tell the story of Jesus. And you know, that story wins in the end, and it will win all, all along the way. So uh, let me start us off in our study this morning with a little prayer. And my uh, prayer this weekend, uh, as always, is a, just a humble God bless America. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have called us here to be uh, family, and you've taught us to lean on each other. Uh, bless our church, bless our worship, uh, bless our nation. May we be an honor to you. And as uh, a people who are called to go inside out, teach us that we have a story that should not be kept to ourselves. Send us into the world to reach uh, a lost people in the name of Jesus. And this morning, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. All right, open in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. We're in a series of studies this summer on a little letter called Galatians. It was written by the Apostle Paul, a first century preacher and evangelist, who wrote to a little region that's in modern-day Turkey called Galatia, where there were little house churches all over the place that he had helped start. Uh, And they uh, they have a problem going on in Galatia. Uh, He has gone in saying the, the love of Jesus Christ is absolutely free. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. You never could have earned it in the first place. It's just a free gift. Just accept it. But then some legalists have come to town and said, no, 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 that's not how it is. You have to be legalistic. You have to follow lots of rules. You have to prove to God that you're working hard enough uh, to earn your way to heaven, to earn your way to God's favor. And if you don't do that, well, it's all a wash. Just believing in Jesus isn't enough. So that's, that's now the great tension. And while you may not live in a world where people are gathered all around you saying you have to earn God's love by doing, doing lots of works, you do live in a world where lots of people around you are saying, I'm probably good enough for God. Like, I don't really need the whole church thing. I don't need the whole Jesus thing. If there really is a God in the end, by the time I get there, he'll probably look at me and say, you did a pretty good job. I mean, if there is a hell, it's reserved for those really, really horrible, nasty, like, you know, 2% of the world out there. And I'm clearly not in that group. I'm probably fine. Have you ever seen the studies they do in the American population where they ask, do you believe in hell? And do you believe you're going there? Right? The percentages are very different, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, that's probably it. No, I'm definitely not it. Um, so, so you probably know people. You may be a person like this who says, Jesus is fine and all that, but I'm, I'm a good enough person for God. Well, Galatians has a pretty clear message to a world that would say something like that. So pay close attention to this. This is for you and for I and for everybody uh, who we meet who might one day say, I'm probably good enough for God. Uh, let's see what the Bible says about that. Uh, we're in Galatians Chapter 3, and Paul is going to give us three great arguments against the legalists, against people who say you have to be good enough for God or you could be good enough for God. Three great arguments against the legalists. Let's read together in Galatians chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Follow along with me in your Bible and listen to the Word of God. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So here's now the question. 
Did, did, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you come to believe in Jesus? Did you first experience the love of Christian community? Were you made free of a guilty conscience because you were good enough or because God gave it to you for free? And, and it's a rhetorical question. Like, he knows the answer. Uh, are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Uh, and flesh is his word for doing it by your own efforts. If, if you got it for free, are you now trying to turn around and do it on your own efforts? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? Uh, it's a simple question and it's a rhetorical question. Were you good enough for God in the first place and that's why Jesus came and walked among you and died? Did he do it because you were a good people and you, you deserved it, you earned it? Or was it a free gift that he gave you? And then, you know, in, in the Hebrew it's a duh. Right? It's, a, right? He, 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 it's a rhetorical question. Uh, he, he means to say, look, look, you couldn't have done it by your own effort. You trying to do, your, do it by your own effort was the problem. You trying to achieve things by your own effort is what, what made, made it a mess. Uh, you by your own effort proved over and over and over again that you broke the law, that you could not fulfill the law. And in so doing, you worked up a debt. Now, where you're in debt... You don't have the money to pay the debt. That's why it's a debt. Jesus on the cross received the punishment that all of your sins deserved. So you don't have to go around feeling guilty for them, nor do you have to go around trying to work them off. It all went to the cross, just let it go. Your debt has been paid. Why on earth when your debt has already paid, would you turn around and try to pay it yourself? I remember when I was a teenager and I got my first uh, speeding ticket and I was going really, really fast. It's a Volkswagen, and good engineering. And I remember I was just mortified because I knew it was going to be hundreds of dollars, and I didn't have hundreds of dollars as a teenager. And I, uh, I had to go home and tell my parents I was just mortified, and my mom said, well, you need to call your dad, and you need to tell him at work that you got a speeding ticket. I said, oh, no. So I called my dad, and I told him, I got a speeding ticket, uh, and I think it's going to be hundreds of dollars. And he said, uh, you know, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And he did. He paid for it. I couldn't have paid for it, and I slowed down. And I remember getting off the phone and saying to my mom, he wasn't even mad. And in that moment of grace, she said, that's because he got a speeding ticket two weeks ago. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad my parents had joined this church. Um, but, but look, when the, debt is already, when the debt is already paid, you don't have to pay it again. Like when, when somebody has already paid the debt for you, you are debt free. When Jesus went to the cross, you became debt free. If you walk around with a guilty conscience thinking I should have, should have been different or lived different or, or I, you know, I'm good enough, I can earn my way to God, don't, don't try to pay a debt that has been paid. Imagine somebody who has a minimum wage job winning the lottery and then saying to themselves, oh, that's millions of dollars. It's going to take me forever to work enough to earn that millions of dollars. No, 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 you want it already. It's yours. You don't now have to earn it. It was a gift. You won it. It was, in that case, it was blind luck is what it was. Uh, and probably a waste of money getting there. But, but you don't have to earn it. Why would you try to earn something that's already yours? Imagine a, a baseball player who's on a team that goes to the World Series. But when it's, the team is in the World Series, he gets injured and cannot play. But then the team wins the World Series anyway. He is on a World Series winning team, despite the fact that he couldn't do it. It was done for him. Can you imagine after that saying, oh, now I have to go try to win a World Series by myself to you know, pay back the team for doing it for me. Well, that's, no, that's ridiculous. You already did it. Even if it wasn't you, it has been done for you. And this is now the message of the gospel. Paul will say to the Galatians, why, why on earth would you go back to trying to prove yourself to God? It's already been done for you. After beginning with the Spirit, don't return to the works of the flesh. What you've received for free, you don't have to go and earn. Right? That should be good news for heavy consciences. Okay, so then he goes on. Uh, verse 6. Now he's going to, okay, so that was his first argument. His first argument was you got it for free in the first place. Why would you go back and try to do it again? Now he's going to give us a second argument against legalism and against trying to earn God's favor. And in this one, he's going to do a very sophisticated uh, legal move. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee, a Jewish rabbi trained in the law, and he knew how to debate the law, and he knew how to, to, to mine the Hebrew texts for texts that supported an argument, because this is what the Jewish, law Jewish lawyers did. And so he knows these legalists have come to Galatia saying, uh, saying uh, 
you, you have to go back and follow all of the laws of Moses, the Ten Commandments and then all the 620 laws of the command, uh, Old Testament. You have to go back and obey all of them because we got that from Moses. Who's this Jesus guy? He's new. Uh, see, in, um, in modern American law, the latest contract is the one that's binding. If, a, if uh, uh, two people sign a new contract, it cancels out the old contract, right? The new one replaces the old one. In Hebrew covenantal law, the old contract is the most important one. It was the first one, and it's the most significant. So that one counts the most. So the legalists are saying, go back and look at the law of Moses. This Jesus guy is new. We have an older covenant from Moses, and that says you satisfy God by obeying the law. So Paul is now going to one-up them and go to an even older covenant than that. Verse 6. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham from the book of Genesis, right? Before Moses, before there was a law. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles, the, the non-Jewish people, everybody else in the world, would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So, so understand now, they're going back to Moses and saying, Jesus is new, Paul is new, we have an old contract and the old one counts. And Moses got the law and said, follow these laws and that's how you honor God. Paul one-ups them and he says, I can go back a few generations before that, look at Abraham. Before there was a law, God called Abraham and Sarah. He chose this couple, and they had not earned it, and they didn't deserve it. God said, you and all of your descendants are going to be my people. I choose you. And it was a free gift. And Paul will say, that happened 2,000 years ago to prepare us for the day when God would walk among us as Jesus Christ and say again, this is a free gift. You didn't earn it. You can't earn it. Just believe in me. Um, it's, uh, it's going back to an, an older contract, an older covenant, and, and uh, you, have, you have some sense for what that's like if you're in a family, because there are, there are older contracts that have more weight than newer contracts. So, for instance, I had a friend who, um, who uh, left town, and he was going to leave the kids with, uh, with their, their grandma, and so he left town, and he said, now, kids, while I'm gone, I don't want you eating candy and playing video games. And he left town, when he came back into town, he found them with grandma playing video games and eating candy. And he said, I told you not to play video games and eat candy, and I am your parent. And the kid said, yes, but she is your parent. And she, they said, it's okay. <clears throat> Which reminds me, a couple of weeks ago, I was on vacation, and I saw a little sign in a store that says, the children are spoiled because no one spanks grandma. And I, I took a picture of it and sent it to my mom. So I'm so glad that my parents attend this church. Um, and so this is, this is what Paul is doing. I can, I can appeal to a law that was before your law. If you really know your scriptures, if you really know the Hebrew Hebrew texts, you know that God saved us for free. Uh, C.S. Lewis does something like this in his children's books, The Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, if you've never read them, they're these beautiful, adorable adventure stories uh, that take place in a world called, called Narnia where animals can talk. And C.S. Lewis, who is a profound Christian theologian and Oxford professor, uses these children's books to teach us theology through the mouths of these kids and these animals. So in this world of Narnia, there's a, a, an evil witch who has brought winter to Narnia and wants to keep the whole land blanketed in snow and in, and in winter. And uh, she, she, she is trying to, to keep out anything that would change it. But there's a, a Christ figure in the story, someone who's trying to save Narnia, and that is Aslan, the lion. And so the children go into this world and they encounter Aslan and they encounter the, the witch and they realize there's this, this battle going on. And one of the children actually lies and betrays his brothers and sisters because he's under the witch's spell. And the scene comes where the witch confronts Aslan, confronts the lion, and she says, you know the, the, what she calls the deep magic, the oldest law, the oldest covenant. You know the deep magic that a traitor belongs to me. And he says, yes, but there's a, there's a deeper magic before that that says uh, one who has, who has been pure can give himself in place of the traitor. And Aslan gives himself over to her. Right? Now, I won't ruin it and tell you what it happens, but it has a lot to do with the story of Jesus. Right? Um, but read the line, the witch in the wardrobe. So this, this is the story. There's, a, there's an older covenant. There's an older story that came before Moses, before the law, and that one counts for more. So now Paul's given us two important arguments against the legalists, against people who think they can earn their way to God or think you have to earn your way to God, uh, or think you can be good enough for God. Two arguments. One, you got it by free in the first place. You experience Christian community not because you were good enough, but because Jesus came and saved you. And if you and I are sitting here in this room believing in Jesus today, that was a gift. 
Whatever influence in our life came along, whatever people came alongside us, that was Jesus' hand working in our lives. And secondly, the scriptures themselves say that that's the way it works. If you know the Hebrew text well, that is, that is the story. Now he's going to give us a third uh, and powerful uh, argument against the legalists in verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Okay, so now he's pulling up the fine print. And the fine print says, if you're going to be a pretty good person, and you one day intend to stand in front of a perfect God and say, I was a pretty good person, let me in, we should be fine, you're going to have to go back and read the fine print in the contract that this perfect God wrote. Because in all the 620 laws of the Old Testament, if you read down about three quarters of the way through, there's this one that says, and if you don't do everything required by the law, it's all a wash. If you don't do everything required by the law, you just failed. You didn't make it. And you don't read it because it's in the fine print. It's like when iTunes changes its licensing, right? I don't read that. I want to listen to Taylor Swift. Just accept. She's so good. Accept, yes. Right? And in the fine print, it could say you just sell your soul. I don't know. I just accepted it because I didn't read the fine print, right? Or every time Facebook changes its privacy policy, I don't, I don't read it. I Sure, violate my privacy. I need to put a picture of my dinner up on Facebook. Yes, accept. Right? Well... People who go around in this world, people that you know in your life who say, I'm probably good enough for God. I'll probably, stay. you know, I don't need church or Jesus. I'll just be there one day. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't terrible. You might want to read the fine print in that contract because you didn't write it. He did. And there's a little line about three quarters of the way down that said, good enough isn't good enough unless it's perfect. Right? That's the law. This is Paul's third great argument. You don't want to be there on that day leaning on yourself and saying, I was good enough the very attempt proves that you were a failure. Uh, it reminds me of a, a, an IQ test I remember taking when I was in elementary school. Uh, and uh, it was this pattern of dots on a page. And uh, as I recall, you were to connect all the dots to one another with a single line, but the line couldn't cross itself. You, you had to make a straight line that never crossed over itself. And I remember staring at this, and I couldn't figure it out, and I tried it a couple times, and it didn't work, and I finally went to the teacher, and I said, I can't, I can't do this one. This one's too hard. And she said, that one is a trick question. That is an unsolvable puzzle. And the test is to see whether you are smart enough to say this puzzle is unsolvable as opposed to just giving up. Uh, and I remember thinking about the meaning of that IQ test on the first day of my remedial geometry class. It was just, uh, I was still wondering about what it, the implications. Um, but that's the law. That's the law, the Old Testament. God gave the law through Moses. Here's the Ten Commandments. Here are the 620 laws. Follow all these commandments. If you want to be a perfect person, if you want to prove yourself to me, do all of this. And by the way, about three quarters of the way down in the fine print, if you break any of them, it's all a wash. Do this perfectly. That was never put in place because we could do it. It wasn't there in the first place so that we could earn our way to God. It's a trick question. It's an unsolvable puzzle. It is the thing that shows us that we should be humble enough to admit that we need a Savior. Anyone who stands before God on that day and says, I was probably good enough, probably should have been humble enough to read the fine print. That the test was unsolvable. The law cannot save us. Being good enough will not get you there. You and I have racked up a debt, and we need somebody else to pay it off. Jesus went to the cross and received the punishment we deserved all you have to do is believe. As we gather around this table on this, this weekend of the month, we remember what he did when he went to the cross for us. This is a reminder that we could not do it ourselves, but we need him. And this isn't a table for people who are perfect and have lived well and have figured out and done right. I remember um, hearing a friend of mine say that uh, uh, he was sitting in church when he was a little boy, and uh, there was uh, somebody sitting next to him, and when the communion tray went by, they didn't take communion. And this little boy said, my grandfather was so boisterous and so feisty, he leaned over this person's shoulder and said, why did you take communion? And this embarrassed person said, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't feel good enough. And the grandfather, and you know, in the quiet church says, it's for you then, it's for you. This table is for we who could not do it. It's for us. 
So these are then Paul's three arguments against those who are legalists, who think you should earn your way to God or can't earn your way to God. One, you didn't get here in the first place by earning it. Two, if you go back and read the Scriptures, you'll see that God saved Abraham in the first place as a gift. And three, if you read the fine print of the law, you'll realize that's not what the law was for uh, at all. Now Paul wraps it up. Verse 11, clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Uh, and that's actually sort of a bad translation. What it means is the person who believes in the law will live solely by the law. Uh, and in other words, if you can't do it, don't put your eggs in that basket. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Uh, somebody had to pay the debt. Somebody deserved the blame. And on the cross, Jesus said, let it be me. I'll do it for them. Uh, it's kind of like uh, if you had a report card for life. And on the report card, instead of math and English and science, it had integrity and goodness and faithfulness and love. Uh, I don't know about you, but mine would be, you know, D, D minus F, F, F. Right? The only one who got straight A's was Jesus. And on the cross, what he did is he took those two report cards and he switched the names. He put his name on my report card and my name on his report card. And on the cross, he received the failure that I deserved. And I got straight A's. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, in other words, to everybody else, everybody in the outside world, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Why did he do it? So that the church would go inside out. So that insiders would go outside and outsiders could become insiders in the family of faith. He did it so that one day the whole world would be reached with a message that God loves a broken and lost people. We didn't deserve it. We don't deserve it. It's a free gift. Just take it. And then go and be a missionary. Reach a lost world for Jesus. You can do it where, where you sit. You can do it where you live. Uh, I, uh, I met a woman in our congregation uh, just this last week. And I, I love the fact, you know, I, I meet all kinds of people at the door, and sometimes we never get past hello and how you're doing, but I like when I get to sit down with somebody and get to know them a little bit better because people have fascinating stories. And there's this, this woman in our congregation that I met, and we were just chit-chatting, get to know each other. And I said, are you, in, uh, are you in any of our small groups? Have you ever been in one of our Bible studies? And she said, well, well, no, actually, because I already lead one myself, and I was already leading it before I came here. And none of the people in it go to this church. She said, it's, it's kind of strange. Some of them go to churches, but they go to churches where they've somehow picked up the message that good enough is good enough, and if you're a good person, you're fine. And they really haven't heard the story of Jesus, and so they sit in my Bible study with me and say, I've never heard these things before. And she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here, and I'm going to keep doing this, because there's a chance that through our study together, they'll actually learn the gospel. And suddenly this person who is just a hello at the door, I realized, was a missionary with a powerful ministry turning the church inside out. If you come this morning with a heavy conscience because you don't think you deserve to be at the presence of God, or if you come with a self-righteous conscience because you think you do deserve to be in the presence of God, let's take all of it and lay it in front of the cross this morning and gather around the table that is for the family of God and remember that it's because of Jesus and not because of us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you love us and you came down here and walked among us and that you died for us. I pray this morning that your spirit would move in this room. And if anybody here has never said it before, we pray, Jesus, forgive the things that we've done wrong. Thank you for paying our debt. Be our Lord and Savior and teach us to lean on you. May we be your missionaries, turning the church inside out. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.